Hi, this is Stephen, and I want to thank you for joining us on this wisdom journey. You can do us a huge favor by subscribing to our channel and liking our page, and that will help more people discover this Bible teaching ministry. You can hit the notification button to be updated whenever we post a new video. And I also hope you'll share these videos with your friends and family. Most importantly, that this study will help you walk in wisdom. Thank you again. It's been said that nothing reveals a person's character and spirit more than their correspondence. Whether it's letters, social media, uh, contacts, posts, phone calls, uh, they have a way of revealing who we are and, and really what we want in life. Reminds me of a little girl who wrote this letter to President Gerald Ford way back in the 1970s. Dear Mr. Ford, Mothers and fathers get to have Mother's Day and Father's Day, so why can't we have Kids Day? Please, let us have Kids Day. Yours truly, Stacy. <laughs> President Ford, I understand, kept that letter as one of his all-time favorites. Well, today we open a letter called the Second Epistle of John. That's just a little note to an anonymous woman and her children. Uh, even though his name isn't attached, there's no doubt that John, uh, the apostle, is the author. In fact, eight of the 13 verses in this little postcard here are identical to verses found back in 1 John. At this uh, point in time, John is around 90 years old when he, when he writes this note. I find that amazing. At that age, he's still writing to encourage other people. Well, it reveals so much of John's character and spirit. Now, the letter opens here in verse 1 with these words, the elder to the elect lady and her children. Now, John doesn't start with something official like, you know, John the Apostle or even John the last living apostle. He could have, but he he really isn't trying to throw any apostolic weight around. He's, he's satisfied, frankly, with being known as the elder. And that was a term of endearment that the church at large had given him. Now, who's this elect lady? Well, some believe the title is a metaphor for the church, either uh, the universal church or one specific local church church. Well, let me tell you, beloved, the church is never called or considered the mother of believers in the New Testament. The church doesn't give birth to believers. Only God does that. Uh, believers aren't birthed by the church when they join the church, when they walk into the church. Believers are the church. So the idea of a metaphor, well, that doesn't fit in here. The word elect happens to be an adjective that can be translated faithful or excellent. So, frankly, John is writing to a faithful Christian woman of distinction. Now, since John doesn't mention her husband, it's likely she's a widow. She's certainly a single mom. In fact, she has children here who are evidently grown. Now, after an affirmation of love and, and greetings filled with blessings in verses 1 through 3, John writes now in verse 4, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. Now, in saying here that he found some of this mother's children following the truth of the gospel, well, that implies that some of her children were not. Either they no longer walked in the truth or they never did. By the way, this is a reminder to every Christian mom and dad today of the blessing of having grown children who are walking with Christ. But it's also not a condemnation if those grown children do not. That's the work of God. No parent can guarantee that. But it is our prayer, isn't it? John's words here would have been a great encouragement to her that the apostle was, was aware of her burden those children who are not walking with God. Beloved, today, if you happen to have children or grandchildren who are living faithfully for Jesus, re rejoice over them. Thank God for that. What a rich blessing. If you have some children who've strayed from the truth or who've never come to the, to the truth, the, the faith of, of their fathers, perhaps their mother, you, 
as a faithful Christian. Well, don't, don't lose hope. Keep praying for them. They're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And even though you may, uh, God never will lose sight of them. He knows exactly where they are today. Well, now with that, John writes here in verse 5, And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now, John changes the pronoun, the plural, by writing here, we love one another. He's including this woman, her children, and her entire church. Now, well, he, he knows she's going to share this note with all the believers in her life, and, and he wants them all to love one another. Now, what does loving one another look like? Well, John answers that here in verse 6. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. In other words, walking in love is wrapped up in God's truth. So, walking in love is walking in, in the truth. And let me tell you, our world today has separated love from truth. They've reduced love to emotion or attraction or passion. The problem is when the passion fades and emotions died down, well, so does that kind of love. God's definition of love is, is much more than that. It isn't something you feel. It's something you choose. And that choice can lead to feeling. But love is choosing to act, to give, to sacrifice, and our emotions follow. This is the love of Jesus. He chose to sacrifice his life for ours. And it wasn't because we were attractive to him. In fact, the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Well, now John adds one of his favorite warnings here to this dear woman and her family, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Now, John's expression here that they've gone out into the world implies that they're out on a mission to find followers. In fact, the language is similar to that of the Lord's great commission to us. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Have you ever thought about the fact that Satan has his own disciple makers carrying out his own demonic commission? And, and his ambassadors are just as passionate as, as we are. Sometimes I'm afraid they're even more passionate than we are. And from what John is telling us here, they have already gone out into the world. They're already at it which means we've got some catching up to do, beloved. Reminds me of Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, the famous author who once said that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Well, here in verse 7, John refers to these false teachers as, once again, antichrists. That little prefix anti means against, and it could also mean instead of. So, antichrists are against Christ, but they also try to substitute a false gospel about Christ for the true gospel. Now, John warns this woman and her children here in verse 8, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. I got to tell you, this verse has always been a motivating verse to me. We as Christians cannot lose our salvation, but we can evidently lose our full reward. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before the Lord one day with, with empty hands. I want to be able to place my rewards at his feet in gratitude for what he enabled me to accomplish for his glory. This verse ought to motivate us all to keep serving the Lord until we see him one day. Well, now with that, John ends this little postcard, this little note, with a promise to visit this family in the near future. Now, we don't know if he ever made it there. History and tradition agree that, that John received the final revelation from God, which we call the Book of Revelation, on the island of Patmos, where he is exiled and he'll die soon after that. 
But here in verse 13, John adds a final comment that the children of this woman's faithful sister send their greetings as well. So he ends like he began on a very personal note. Think about this for a moment. John is the famous author. He's a, he's a bestseller. He's a church leader. He's written more inspired scripture than any other apostle. Yet he takes time to write a little note to a mother and her children. I can't imagine how encouraged this single mom would have been to read and reread John's little note. Let me tell you, in this letter, John is revealing himself, his heart. He's modeling godly character and grace. So let's do the same. You know, if you had just a few more months to live, whom would you contact? Uh, who is it that you'd want to visit? To whom would you write a little note? Well, the real question is this. What are you waiting for? Maybe you ought to do something like that today. Well, until we set sail again, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.